And what's what's a, I also noticed the the trend of not not necessarily the trend because it happened 20 years ago when people, uh, especially we were graduating and, and heading off to Europe and they were going from city to city, and and people would talk about oh I did I did Prague I did Bucharest I did, and they were there for a, a day or two and and this doing. Um, is kind of the, the first level and the next level is you're, you're trying to experience all these things but um, I think in, in some ways you have to change this checkbox of, of experiences to you know really was it was it meaningful and and spending five days ten days in a, in a city when I was traveling um, when now when I look back and I see the times that I spent five or ten days in a in a particular city when I was moving every day or every two days it was those five or ten day periods that upon reflection were more meaningful. I met more people. I had a greater um, a fondness to that place, really because I slowed down and, and, and tried to connect with individuals uh, more, more deeply. And I think that's really what Outpost allows is the ability to, to slow down, uh, to meet more people, and then to be able to, to travel with them or to travel with that community. Welcome back, everyone, to the Look Up Podcast. I'm your host, Mark Weinstein. This is episode number 18, and I just finished listening to this episode, and I have to say I can't wait to bring this one to you all. Uh, This was super, super interesting conversation with David Abraham. So first, a little bit of background on David. David is an entrepreneur, author, and a leading expert on technology resources to power the green generation. He's been published numerous times in the New York Times, the LA Times, and the Wall Street Journal Asia. But most recently, David co-founded Outpost, which is a next-generation travel and hospitality brand whose mission is to help remote professionals and digital nomads to join the remote revolution and design their best lives. Outpost has a number of co-living and co-working spaces in Southeast Asia with its earliest locations in Bali. David's prior work spanned many countries, including the US, Lithuania, Japan, China, and now Indonesia. He's worked both in the public and private sector and has even spoken before Congress on the subject of rare earth materials. So naturally, I was extremely excited to speak to someone with such a unique background whose knowledge and experience sits at the intersection of so many relevant and now newsworthy subjects. So for starters, we went through Outpost, we did an overview speaking about the future of work, the pros and cons of being a digital nomad, what it means to build community, when marketing is true versus when it's just shallow, uh, building a community around shared values. And given that Outpost is a co-living and co-working space, we of course had to take the opportunity to discuss the recent WeWork drama. And I thought that David brought a great perspective on the issues that led to that company's downfall. Finally, we discussed David's past research into rare earth metals. So for those of you that don't know what rare earth metals are, these are the materials that we use to actually manufacture the high-tech chips that go into all of our laptops, our smartphones, our smart cars, and other important materials uh, in the electronic and internet connected age. So rare earth metals are at the center of ongoing U.S.-China trade talks, which have been deteriorating over the last few weeks. And Indonesia, where David now resides, sits at the intersection of Eastern and Western economic policies. So we're able to also explore the rising tension between the U.S. and China and what that means for all of us. I've always had an interest in China. I studied Mandarin in college. I visited China numerous times, and Chinese philosophy is actually what led me to ultimately to yoga. Um, I started with the Tao Te Ching, and then that brought me to the Yoga Sutras. So massive respect for China and their culture, and really just uh, struggling with what's happening in the news cycle today, and how I believe that the U.S. and China are starting to villainize one another, and tensions are rising. So there's a lot of different material for everyone of different interests. Um, You can skip ahead to whatever part resonates with you the most. And I really hope that you enjoy this episode.
So David, thank you so much for coming on the Look Up podcast. Excited to have you here. Thank you very much, Mark. Great to be here. So you said you're calling in right now from Singapore. That's correct. Awesome. And you spend most of your time in Southeast Asia, correct? Correct. Usually in, in Bali, Cambodia, Singapore. So making the rounds. That's incredible. I, um, you know, I, I was doing research for this episode, as I was just telling you, and um, I'm so excited because you have such a relevant background, um, you know, in, in so many different ways. I mean, uh, there's a number of a number of subjects that I want to dive into here, but I do want to give you just a, a quick opportunity to introduce yourself to the audience, maybe give a little bit of color on your background and, and what you've been up to lately. Sure, sure. I think I think my 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 background really starts back in in 2010. Um, I was remember looking back on on my career. Um, I had the good fortune to work uh, in the White House. I worked at uh, Lehman Brothers in finance. Was working at a commodities trading firm, and had on paper really what seemed like a, a wonderful career. And uh, but something was really tugging at me. And it was the sense that I wanted to do something more international. And so in, in 2010, I, I left uh, my job and started working and traveling. Spent a bit of time in Japan, uh, was in Brazil, was in Estonia, and really was enjoying the, the freedom and the flexibility. But there were two things, I w- there was two things there I was noticing. One, uh, that there were a lot of people starting to work in, in cafes and I knew what I was doing there, but I really had no idea what all these other people were, were doing there. And then two, while traveling and waking up and, and climbing Machu Picchu is a, a fabulous way to, to build up a number of experiences, um, I was feeling doing it on its own was really lacking, lacking meaning. Um, I wasn't able to share those ideas with folks. Um, and um, I could keep a journal, but there was something that was lacking. So uh, a few years later, I chatted with my friend who was also uh, working uh, independently, if you will, and, and he was based in Shanghai and realized he didn't have to be based there either. So we decided to set up a community um, to really support this lifestyle in, in a wonderful place of Bali. And so we set up the community for us uh, and to, to have this, this lifestyle and to have others, have others join us, if you will. And it's really taken off. And so this community is, is Outpost, correct? This community is now what is outpost, correct? And it was a side pro- it was a side project. It was just something you know you wanted to bring people together, like minded individuals um, who realized that they didn't need to be in in a major metropolitan to kind of to work. Right. For for then it was it was it was people like myself. But over time, we've really looked into what does like minded mean for us, and and for us, it's really this entrepreneurial, creative an internationally minded community. And so those are the people that you tend to see at Outpost and, and those are the people that, that Brian and I are inspired by to be around. And that's what we think is uh, the growing area that we really want to focus Outpost on. So, so let's talk a little bit about, um, about the community and the types of people that come through Outpost. So there's this term that's kind of taken off over the last, call it, you know, five years or so, maybe more. Um, really used to define millennials that want to work remotely called digital nomads. Mm -hmm. Um, What is it? What is a digital nomad to you? Sure. Well, a a nomad, I think, is is the key part of that, is that that people who move around from place to place, uh, whether they do that over weeks, months or years. uh, The digital part uh, is really about the way that they with the means that allow them to 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 work And, and digital nomads. Um, initially connotated people who coded, um, sat on the beach, and then, and then went to another beach. And what we've seen was that was in generally the first iteration. Uh, but my partner is a, a good example. He worked in finance, and he uh, didn't code, uh, but he was in tech-enabled. So we really see a lifestyle that's fueling this digital nomad rise is really this tech-enabled lifestyle. And so when he was able to grab internet, he was able to continue his work. And so the digital nomad really to us is the new nomad, people who can work uh, prof- professionally and still continue their, their lifestyle, except do it in a very international way. So and why, so that's what we're most think, excited about. Why do you think so many, so many more young people are choosing to become 
nomads? I think there's many reasons. Uh, one is this sense of uh, that you can do anything. That you look at someone else's Instagram feed and you say, well, I, I want to live that lifestyle or I want to be there. And you see the very best of what people have because usually people don't show the mundane parts of their lives on, on social media. Oh, we'll talk about that. <laughs> so you, you really want to you really want to get out there and, 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 and live the world. Um, people are getting to the point where they'd rather spend uh, money on experiences um, because they found that one, they didn't have as much money for stuff. Um, and then two experiences really last longer in the mind. Um, so people really want to want to get out there. Um, I think that people want things to happen now. And um, with the, the, the cost of airfare being low and the friction points being less in terms of traveling internationally, um, more people speak English, the quality of food is increased, um, there are less risks out there for, for traveling, that people say, hey, this is something that's, that's really not only something I'd like to do, but it's really feasible. And so... Uh, I, I think there are a tremendous number of reasons why, why, why people are, are going. Um, and we just try and be able to fr- provide a, a comfortable community for people to join. Because ultimately, that's what people are, are most concerned about. Yes, they need a place to put their head. And, and yes, they, they need things to see. Uh, but when they, people have joined this particular lifestyle, it's really about who else is out there living it. And how can I connect with them? Because... I don't like to go up to people in coffee shops and say hi, even though they're reading a book that I just read. Or there is this distance that seems to be developing that people aren't as comfortable without to, to meet someone in real life before they've met them on online, online. And so traveling really breaks down those barriers because in many cases you have to meet someone in real life um, because you're, 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 you're in a foreign environment and you can't just wait to meet someone online first. Yeah, there's there's so much to unpack there. And I think in some ways, there's almost this paradox of the digital nomad community. And because, you know, in some ways, digital nomads are not always, but often traveling because they enjoy working independently. They don't love an office environment necessarily. They don't want that nine to five at a cubicle. Um, But then they get to the destination and there's a new kind of isolation um, that comes with being independent. So I want to go travel the world. I want to see, I want to experience things. I want to get out of this mundane where I'm surrounded by people, say, in a city like New York right? Working in an investment banking role as you have and I have in the past. Uh, but then you get there and a few months later, there's there's often, I think, in pre-digital nomad, let's call it the expat community, this um, a, a loneliness as well. And so it's interesting that a lot of digital nomads are leaving one way of living, but still seeking further connection and community. It's, it's this quest that we can choose our communities. Uh, growing up, I um, remember I was friends with uh, Paul who lived down the street. And the reason why I was friends with Paul had nothing to do with our mutual interest of Legos or whatever I was playing with at, at the time, but it really had to do with proximity. And I had to be friends with Paul because if I wasn't friends with Paul, then I didn't have other people around. Um, So we were really limited by our circumstances and we we never thought much about community because it was really physical. Um, Sure, there were there were groups, uh, religious groups or or sports groups, but ultimately you were tied to the physical space. And now people have this selection bias that the communities are defined by um, their interests and not necessarily proximity. And so. Um, it creates a challenge when you move to a new place. You're, you're, you don't know if you're bringing your community or you have to find it where you are. Um, to me, you know, when I, when I moved to a new place and I, I was an expat, I lived in, uh, in Lithuania, I lived in Japan, 
um, I, I, even when I moved from New York to DC, that it took anywhere from three months to, to eight months for all of a sudden when I wake up and say, hey, this is, this is home. And I felt I was in a routine. And so in a lifestyle where people want to feel at home right away, it's, it's really a challenge. Now, when you're traveling internationally uh, in this nomad lifestyle, what's great is that you can really get absorbed within a, 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 um, a lifestyle quite quickly and you're meeting people and having wonderful conversations. But it still takes those shared experiences where you're going to yoga with someone and, and you're going through um, you know, classes several times or you're playing basketball with the same group of people. It still takes those same shared experiences to build up the friendships um, over, over time. And so when you're traveling from place to place, you know, I always advise people really to slow down months in a, in a location um, or longer so that you can build up those, those connections with others. Um, it happens far faster internationally uh, because your, your community is, your physical community is often tighter. But it's, it's, still a, it's still a challenge. There's no easy way to quickly have 15 friends that, that understand you uh, like the people you grew up with. Um, so that's where I think the loneliness comes in. Um, but there, slow down, meet people um, longer is, is, is usually my recommendation. Uh, abs- absolutely. And I think, you know, in some ways for millennials, um, you know, or not even using that term, but even just for, you know, let's call it 20 to 40 year olds that are um, that are searching wet Westerners to whom there's a lot of opportunity we almost are drowned in options. As you mentioned, we're not constrained to physical spaces. And so I think there is this element of, of seeking, of continued seeking, which can lead to a, dis, a kind of dissatisfaction or, or an internal stirring. And I say this from experience, you know, having moved to Los Angeles um, a number of years ago, having traveled all over the world and I've worked independently and in coffee shops just like you. So I think it's, I do think it's important to, to anchor down in communities and to, to find a place that offers the opportunity for you to mix, for us to mix with other people. Because otherwise I think we'll, we'll continue that, that search. That was one thing being on the road as an expat or a digital nomad you know, post-college, I noticed this kind of, everybody felt, many people felt like they were chasing something. Other people felt like they were running from something. And it felt like there was this dissatisfaction that couldn't be satiated. And I don't know that there were opportunities like what Outpost is offering today, where you, you know, you can create community of like-minded individuals and offer people a taste of shared experience that in, encourages and invites them to, to stay a while. Mm-hmm. And what's, what's a, I also noticed the, the trend of, not, not necessarily the trend because it happened 20 years ago when people, uh, especially we were graduating and, and heading off to Europe and they were going from city to city and, and people would talk about, oh, I did, I did Prague, I did Bucharest, I did, and they were there for a, a day or two. And, and this doing um, is kind of the, the first level, and the next level is you're, you're trying to experience all these things. But um, I think in, in some ways you have to change this checkbox of, of experiences to, you know, really was it, was it meaningful? And, and spending five days, 10 days in a, in a city when I was traveling, um, when now when I look back and I see the times that I spent five or 10 days in a, in a particular city, when I was moving every day or every two days, it was those five or 10 day periods that upon reflection were more meaningful. I met more people. I had a greater um, a fondness to that place really because I slowed down and, and, and tried to connect with individuals uh, more, more deeply. And I think that's really what Outpost allows is the ability to, to slow down, uh, to meet more people, and then to be able to, to travel with them or to travel with that community um, as Outpost grows, 
people are able to go from Ubud Bali to Changu Bali to Siem Reap to 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 elsewhere and have a few people that really continue that overall um, thread of a community from place to place. And I think that really gives grounding as you live this international lifestyle. And I, you know, it offers an, an intentionality, I think is maybe, is maybe the word around, mm -hmm. around travel, if you're able to, to stay a while, uh, an outpo outpost can offer that. I think to your point about the two days, right? I, I think that's even accelerated, even visiting Bali, what's that swing set called in Bali? That's basically just, it looks like you're swinging over beautiful water, but it's a mirror set up. Oh, well there's, there's two. There's one that has a mirror set up and it's a temple. And then there's another one called Bali swing, um, which, which, yeah, which is the swing. Yeah, so it's like this famous swing that people go to because it's a beautiful photo. But I think with the addition of Instagram and other platforms, even TikTok or whatever now, you know, it's it's that that consumptive experience, right? When you go somewhere for one or two days and you stay at a hotel or a hostel, you're there to consume that that experience rather than to actually drop in and and meet people and have an experience it's like let me capture the let me qu capture the quick photo let me take the picture at the top of the volcano even though i'm surrounded by 200 people and you know and i can't i can't get can barely get one clean shot but i'm going to pull that one there's five drones flying overhead and and then once i get that photo it's like check i've done this as you described right. i love that i love that differentiation between doing something and being somewhere right i want to you know just kind of continuing forward with the conversation what well, you know i understand why outpost but why bali bali uh i've always enjoyed indonesia so the first time i was there was, was 1990 98 it was a, a difficult time to be there because the economy was was falling apart but i felt the resilience in the in the people um, and then I also felt that the country had so much to see. It was the, it was the fourth uh, most populous country. Um, there were so many islands. There was so much to see. And the, the people were very welcoming and understood at least um, Americans in a, in a different way. And, and what I mean by that is I remember at the time an American comedian was coming through and performing in, in Jakarta. And... I've spent enough time in Japan and, and China and elsewhere to know that humor doesn't always translate so well across cultures. And the fact that American comedian was performing in Jakarta um, really validated my thinking as, as that, hey, there are some similarities in how we think that would allow an a, a American comedian to perform successfully in Jakarta, um, where I couldn't imagine one performing to the same audience in Tokyo or, or, or Beijing. And so there were some similarities that I felt um, a kinship to, to people here. And I had been back to Indonesia several times for um, work or an internship and during research for when I was writing a book and um, felt that if there was a place I wanted to escape to or start a life, life in, it really was, was Bali. And so we set up Bali because of my own self-interest. Um, but when you say the word Bali or you tell people you live in Bali, they start to get a little smile. Uh, they don't exactly know why, but it's really its own own brand and its own ethos. And, it, and so for us to start a company there, um, we feel that's in our DNA. And as we move elsewhere, people understand that, oh, Bali is really about um, not just a fabulous place with its own rich, rich deep culture, um, but a, but about a lifestyle and 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 a, and a relaxed way of living, and so we think that that flows through our, our our company brand as well. Yeah, I mean, like, what's happening there right now? What's what is driving so many people to Bali? I mean, still to this day, it's like uh, the the Balifornians, somebody called them, mm -hmm. people that are going from Venice to Bali or as or San Francisco to Bali. Well, I think there's the the. Ultimately, is, is, is the warmth of the, the Balinese people. Uh, there, there are many islands around the world that share similar characteristics, that they're warm, uh, tropical, um, some good surfing, um, good beaches, amazing 
uh, mountains and volcanoes. Uh, but really, it's the, the consistent culture that the, the Balinese uh, continue to have, whether it's a, a ceremony uh, on a Tuesday that's a full moon that's auspicious for us to open our restaurant, or whether it's the silent day that happens um, coming around March uh, this year, where for the whole day, um, there's no electricity being used and, and, and people stay inside, and it's, and it, and it's still well observed. So it's really a, a culture that's um, very rich in its traditions and very closed, but at the same time, very welcoming to, to outsiders. And so that's really, I think, the base that, that Bali is, uh, the, the warmth of Bali is built upon. And then from that, um, you, you know, they, they do have great natural beauty. So that's accessible and, and, and they've made it uh, easy for someone to, to come in and, and, and to hike a mountain or, or see the temples that they, that they pray at. And so it's very accessible. Um, it's inexpensive. Um, that's uh, obviously one of the, the big factors. And because of that, people have built on some Western services that uh, allow people to come out and, and not miss a beat. Um, so you can really dig in and, and have some great um, nasi goreng or, or um, ayam bakar, which is kind of the local food. Or you can sit there and have a, one of the best cafe lattes that you'll that you'll find. So it's a nice mix of uh, Western and and real strong Balinese and Asian, and it's a good spot for someone to start understanding the lifestyle. You know, I look at countries that are easy to easier to start out: um, Thailand, Bali, uh, Peru. If you're going to get in and look for a, a fabulous place to start, where you're a little uncomfortable. I think those are great places before you start jumping into places like Laos or, or, or Burma or, or places like that. Yeah, and you've been, I mean, you've been all over the world. Um, as you mentioned, you lived in Japan, Shanghai, I believe, or, or you've traveled to China a bunch and Brazil and Rio. Mm -hmm. um, where do you see, you know, as you think about the future of Outpost and where you're expanding to, it feels to me, having visited, that Bali is, and listening to you speak about it, Bali is such a core piece of this and the ethos of the company. Now, how do you think about future locations, maybe future countries uh, for Outpost? Well, we see, we see now where our, our people, our, our, our members are going. Outposters um, go to Thailand, they go to Chiang Mai, they go to Lisbon, they go to Medellin. There's, there's a, a well-trodden path that, that people are going, uh, but increasingly there's a new city that, that pops up on the map. So we've, under, being around for, for four years, uh, originally this was a side project, as, as I mentioned, um, but we've had conversations with the people, we've lived the lifestyle and have a sense of what is fascinating to people who live this way. And so we have a, a list of places where we think uh, people are going we have another list of places we think people will go. And then we have a list of places we think, wow, this would be fun. Um, I don't know if people will go there, but let's, let's, let's make it happen. Uh, so we kind of put all three of those together and that, that helps us determine where we, where we want to head out to next. And when you think about building community is, I think about other communities and other co more co-working spaces or dinner clubs, you know, Outpost is a co-living space, so people actually rest their, their heads there. But many of them are kind of, you know, they have high membership fees and or a stringent application process to, to really curate the community that's being built. I'm curious to hear your take on community building and curation of, of like-minded individuals. Um, I think there's this self selection or self-curation that happens. Um, for example, I remember going to the Aspen Institute um, for um, an event, which is a think tank out in, out in Colorado. And the community was quite tight. It was this internationally minded, policy-oriented uh, group of folks. And, and there was no um, curation process per se, it's just if you were going to spend several thousand dollars to go there or, or were you able to get a scholarship there. And so 
but there was nothing, there was no real criteria that you, you needed. You just needed to be able to pay to go. And I think that increasingly so there is um, self curation that, that's happening in, in groups. Um, there are other organizations that I'm a part of that you have to go through an application process and it's really stringent. And then when you get to the other side, you feel like, oh, I've really made it. And so therefore you have a kinship to people. And then there are a lot of organization companies right now that have an application process to make you feel like that. Um, and, and so what we see is, that if you're coming to spend the, the our cheapest uh, membership is around $35 or so. But if you're coming and spending $35 in Bali, you've made a lot of life decisions along the way to get you there to spend that $35. You've decided to leave your career at home. You've decided to, to take initiative and go somewhere else. You've decided that place is Bali or Cambodia. You've decided you want to be around others who are internationally minded, who are curious, who are entrepreneurial. And therefore, you're one of us. You're an, you're an outposter. Um, by really making all of those decisions to finally get you there, um, that you're part of the community. The question is, as we grow is, how do we identify people before they've made all of those decisions uh, to, 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 to really get out there? Um, and I think that that's, that's our opportunity as we grow and we've got ideas for that. Um, but I think there's this, this sense that people want to be in places or in parts of community that are a, a touch out of their, their reach or that confer upon them some type of status or meaning, uh, that uh, allows them to say, I'm one of the, them, whether it's membership at the, the Soho House or other types of affiliations that, that brand them. Um, because I think people join organizations and increasingly jobs, not because of just the monetary benefit in the case of the jobs, but because it aligns with their personal brand. And, and so that's a, a, a bigger issue, but we feel that the, the outposter brand um, is something that many people really aspire to, or a life of control um, and, and one of exploration. And how do we build kind of one layer deeper than just that surface layer? I've, I've gotten through the Soho House application process and therefore I get to tell people that I'm going to Soho House Malibu this weekend and there's a certain, you know, a certain feeling that I get being able to tell them that and move beyond that to... I'm a part of this community because, and be able to offer offer, you know, both the the participants in the community as well as the community itself to be able to offer something a level deeper than just that status that that blue check mark. Let's call it. I think the community itself has to demand something of people. Um, if it's a place where you're just you you've been conferred and you've gotten into uh, the the organization, if you will and then you're just receiving benefits, then, then I mean, it's, it's, it's still a wonderful experience, um, but you're not as committed to the organization. When I look at, at certain travel groups like Hacker Paradise or Unsettled, which really takes people uh, around the world um, for a month to, to, to live and work in, in really some fabulous places, what they do really strongly is the ability to um, ask something of the participants who, who go on these trips um, share your stories, share your ideas, um, share your, um, your knowledge with others so that they can learn from you. And I think when you're building up all of these shared experiences uh, with other people by offering what you know and, and your perspective, it starts to break beyond the, oh, hey, I'm in this club to I'm a, a contributing member, I'm adding value. And really why I'm here, of course, it's nice to say these things, but I really feel a part of, of, of the other people's lives around me who are also in this organization. Absolutely. I like the idea of, of requiring something of your, of your participants, not necessarily you know, mandatory, but holding them to a certain standard of participation, mm -hmm. so to speak. And maybe there are ways to, to encourage, that, you know, encourage that type of behavior. I know that Outpost, you know, one of the things that I liked about what you guys were doing was the programming that you were getting. And that's actually how we connected was um, I've, I was, you know, lucky enough to be invited to speak to a group 
at the outpost in Abud about my experience with Fire Festival. And I saw all of the programming that you guys had laid out. And I think that's an interesting element to, you know, to bringing people together, then participating in those activities together. When we do things, when we share ex real experiences, I think it's, it's um, critical. I think one other, one other aspect, uh, Mark, that's, that we find important is that you, you get to that next level of conversation, not the, the, the what did you do, but why did you do it? And so we had the, the founder of um, Gojek, which is a, a unicorn, um, a, a start, a unicorn uh, startup in, in Indonesia that focuses on the transportation system network. And he eventually left a few years after the first rounds. And, and the questions that we asked were about his transitions. Why did he decide to leave? Um, what were the decisions um, along the way that he thought um, enabled the, country, the, the company to grow? What were those key decisions? What were decisions he'd like to have back and why? And really to understand the thinking of someone who's been successful. And I think that really starts to open people's eyes as opposed to... Um, you know, the, knowing about the, the the first round of funding they got, or or why absurd, you know, why did they um, choose green as, as their color? Or you, you got to get to that next level of of of, of personal decision making and reflection upon what was good and bad um, to really be able to break down and, and and start connecting with people on a deeper level. And that's and that's. It. <laughs> That's what this partially what this is about, you know, is honing honing inquiry, um, in improving my ability to have conversations, learning new things, um, you know, satiating my own personal curiosity about different subjects. And I have a friend, Stuart Alsop, who produces a podcast called Crazy Wisdom. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, he started a group on Facebook that is literally just about asking questions and question questions that start with the words kind of why how, what tend to be better than the, you know, multiple choice type questions that we have a tendency to ask. So every episode of this, I think this is the 17th that I've recorded. I'm trying to improve my ability to kind of ask questions that, that enable my guests to really share a layer deeper. Mm -hmm. um, I guess maybe even on that note, I wanted to talk to you about something that's really in the news right now, which I'm certain is, is having an effect on your business and, and, well, possibly having an effect on your business or at least the perception of what are you, what are you, what is your perception of on WeWork and what's happening there and how that's affecting the, the kind of the the perception of co-working and co-living globally? Sure. I think um, WeWork offers a, a, a tale of more of investors than than the, the companies themselves. Um, Taking a step back, uh, I mean, we're similar to, to WeWork as, as, as movie theaters are to Netflix um, in the sense that they're, they're a, a, an office, a physical office um, that really works on a model where they um, rent out uh, individual spaces and um, uh, try and split them into smaller increments and then s and rent them out at a, at a higher price. And really what our model really focuses on is, is the people and the services that they need. Um, when Brian and I started, um, we, we needed a place to work and we needed a community to, 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 to meet. And as we've grown, we've seen people coming and they need a place to live and they want services that really meet their, their lifestyle. So we offer trips um, and it's really about a community support um, rather than a real estate uh, play. Um, but with that said, I think it, the, the WeWork um, story is about what investors are, are valuing and, and pushing for, for certain companies um, to have and the focus in on, on growth of revenue um, over, over profitability. And then um, the investment community is continuing to push for, for larger and larger and larger and uh, similarity in, in products so you can scale. And they thought that there was a certain value to that proposition. And you get to the regular investors on the, the, the street, uh, if you will, or looking for long-term profitability, and they have different metrics. Um, so you've come in with, with two different value systems, and the, the, it seems as though the, the value system of, hey, you build a business, it runs profitably, um, you take that profit and then you invest it in somewhere else or you give it to your shareholders, is the one that's, that's winning out over opposed to 
hey, you grow, you grow, you grow, and then you figure out what to monetize, and 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 then you figure it out, and then you monetize it some more. Um, I, I think that you you just don't have WeWork in that sense. Um, you have a number of other um, startups that have gone public and haven't performed in in, in the same way. Um, but I think when you look at it holistically, if a certain set of investors are saying, hey, something is valued at Y, and then the next set it comes along and says, it's really not Y, it's, it's really X, then you have to really look at the, the, the mismatch. Um, we, as, as people who have startups, are, have a keen vision of where we want to go, um, but we're not the only people in determining where the company grows. Um, when you're selling a piece of your, your equity rather than a loan, uh, rather than getting debt, um, you're giving someone else a piece of the wheel. And those people are pushing and pushing and pushing because their value is not on in terms of debt, which is a stable cash flow to return to pay back the money, but really growing the business as, as quickly as possible. They have different value systems. So I think we're at a point where um, we're going to re- start rethinking those, those value systems um, for younger companies that are starting up. And there'll be more of a focus on, on profitability uh, in the future. Yeah, I would say, I mean, to me, it's not, it's not, we work is not so much a problem of debt so much as it's a problem of growth for growth's sake, which I think you touched on. And that does come down to a miss, a mismatch of incentives between early equity investors that need growth to get to the next up round um, for a venture backed company and continue to push for high, ever higher up rounds until they get to that liquidity event whether it be an initial public offering or, um, or an acquisition from a larger company. And I think what we saw with WeWork was this, was this kind of Frankenstein version of that where the unit economics didn't even make sense um, for this company, meaning that you know, they, were not, they were offering discounted rents that would make, make each property or many of the properties just completely unprofitable even even on a, I think a gross margin standpoint before all of the operating expenses of running the overarching business. But what I think is important, an important lesson from WeWork, you know, as just another recent example of, of startup drama, right? I came from Fire Festival. That's why I'm doing this podcast. We had Theranos. I met I think um, Erica Chung spoke at Outpost as well. She was the whistleblower for Theranos, 23 years old. And I think we're seeing a proliferation of these issues. Uh, and some of it comes down to what I, what I call entrepreneurship worship, mm-hmm. where we hear these mythical stories of Elon Musk sleeping on the Tesla factory floor for seven nights, getting financing for SpaceX, Tesla, and Solar City overnight, right before going bankrupt or never take no for an answer, don't quit. And these, these, these seemingly good stories and, and you know, trying to be positive advice get Frankenstein and turned into something entirely different. And I think that's partially what happened to WeWork is just, you know, good idea, just process through this, this monster creation machine that is Silicon Valley and, and venture capital and out at the other side, we get a whole lot of narrative, a whole lot of vision and vision fund and not a lot of execution. And so, yeah, I, I don't necessarily know that WeWork is, um, is I, I, I agree with you. I don't believe that WeWork is necessarily representative of the co-living and co-working other companies in the space in general, but it, it was the driver of valuation expectations for those types of companies going forward. And so I imagine that it must be a little bit challenging, especially because this guy, Adam, was selling, he was selling, this is more than a co-working space. This is a lifestyle. We're the we company. We're, you know, we're about revolution and take and young people taking over no more suits and ties. Right. But it was, it wasn't that. I think that, but that's, there are a number of, there's a planning company out there that sells software um, that, 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 that talks about it's redefining how, how humans interconnect with each other because you can, have a, you, you can make a calendar event with someone more easily or track their progress towards an event. And 
but we've been historically been able to meet people and to track progress towards uh, a, a an event um, or or a project that you're working with. So uh, there is this sense of of grandioseness. Um, now I don't know if that's geared towards the investors or the people who use the product, but when it works right, like Lululemon, and people feel a part of something and a, and a lifestyle, it works out well for both the people who are using the products and, and the company. But when it goes wrong... Where is that? Where Because it's so nuanced. Right. Where is that line between this is truly in our DNA versus this has somehow been greenwashed or whitewashed or right. millennial washed or whatever? How do we identify when something is, is soulful versus... Yeah marketing right right well i think there was always the sense that we work was was on the on the outer edge of of that yeah um, <laughs> and that lululemon stayed closer to home um but it, it, you can be cynical and say well it depends on the ability of the of the of the marketing and branding team um, <laughs> to to create that sense and align it with the with the operations of the company um it's but I've been on the it's other side, art, though. You know, yeah. The marketing team can do a phenomenal job, but we need to execute on what that vision is being sold. Otherwise, right. we end up with a cheese sandwich. Right. And, and it's, uh, I think increasingly we're just seeing, we're seeing, uh, I guess, the emperor has no clothes, let's say, for a lot of, a lot of these companies. Right. And there is the push to, you know, that romanticizes the entrepreneur and, 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 to me, you know, an, an entrepreneur was a was a label that someone had because they started a business and it was successful and then they had another business and then that was successful and they were an entrepreneur and it was a noun. And now people have kind of switched to this entrepreneur as someone who's at least attempted something and it seems to be more of an adjective of a way that people want to live their lifestyle and they want to try things and they want to fail fast. And I was an entrepreneur because I did X, but, but you didn't even really try. It was just saying you had a website and then it didn't work and you got tired. So you went back to your, other, your old job. You know, it's, 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 a, it's seductive, like you said, the sleeping on the floor. Um, I, had, I had a previous guest on the show named uh, David Sachs, who wrote a book called Revenge of the, Re the Revenge of Analog. And his current book he's working on is on redefining entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. And that's his thesis is an entrepreneur is, is all sorts of things. You can own a, a restaurant and you are an entrepreneur. The, the corner store in New York City, you know, the, the manager that runs that or that built that is an entrepreneur. And we've kind of per, in the West and now in the East. And I want to talk a little bit about where you sit currently physically in Southeast Asia as kind of the convergence of these two cultures. But in both the US and now in China, where there's a number of unicorns that are popping up as well, I think we've we've evolved to view the entrepreneur as the as the hero in either a controlled capitalist system like like China or a democratic capitalist system like America. Um, and and there's issues with that. The average millennial will has responded recently, and I, I don't, don't know where the survey is, I'll link out to it, but the average millennial will cheat in order to get their dream house, mm -hmm. right? So what does that say about where we are? Um, go ahead. I can't, I, I can't really speak to that particular step, but I, I think when you go back to the, the you know, the entrepreneur, is it the, the the risk taking, the ability to put it out there and, and try something is what people want to have been known for. Um, but the, the entrepreneur in my mind is someone who's actually taken that risk and then not only taken that risk, but been successful in that. Um, and then who's been successful on it on, 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 on a couple of times and been able to steer their, to steer their business. Um, but you know, I think that there is this sense that um, when you've, when you've made it as an entrepreneur, that that you're the you're the success. Um, but I do think that a lot of it has to do with things that are out of your control. 
um, the timing, the people you know, um, the, the connections that, that you develop. I mean, when you look at a lot of the successful um, tech entrepreneurs, the ideas weren't necessarily theirs that they started with, if you will. It's just the duplication of someone else's uh, ideas. Um, so not that that doesn't take talent to execute, but it's not this kind of visionary um, Steve Jobs type of character that you, that you have. I, I, I agree. I believe we tend to focus on outcome when we, when we measure people. We tend to focus on results rather than process. And there's, right. a lot of, there's a lot of, you know, pattern fitting to different models that we do after the fact or we make a decision and then we rationalize it. I think that's a similar bias, cognitive bias that we have when we look at someone who had success and we say they are, you know, successful. Um, just as I, I don't believe that someone that has failed is a failure. And I think we need to move beyond that, that sort of nomenclature. But I think so, what you highlight is, is how you do something is as important or more important than, than always the results. Like if the process is good, if you value people, if you support one another, you know, that adds more to, to other people's well beings than necessarily the the finished product that y you have. Um, and I think, you know, I, I think this, this, this notion of being the entrepreneur and, and being um, the, the person and, and really celebrating that is something that I still, I start to see is changing. Um, and that people really don't necessarily need to be something, but uh, are being a part of something is something is is i think the next wave is it if people can align with something that's valuable to them and they can be a part of it maybe this is more my hope but i, I feel that people are now coming to, to to me and saying how do how can i be a part of something not necessarily how can i replicate what you're what you've done um and to me that's in, inspiring how can i be of service right how can i how can i support how can i participate I, I agree. I think, I think that's also, you know, also <laughs> it's interesting because in our search for becoming a part of something, we also are now moving towards this, this global tribalism uh, that we're seeing. And so it's so meaning that I, I label myself as part of a community, the same, you know, whether it be Soho house, whether it be Democrat, Republican, American, Chinese, it's like, which team do you play for? Right. You know, it, go, it, it cuts both ways. I'm not trying to be the cynic in, in this episode. I'm not always the cynic, but, you know, I, I, I think it's, it's, it's funny. It's when we start to define ourselves, when we start to, to um, triangulate the different data points that make up our perceived identity, then we, we can get ourselves in trouble and, and it creates this, these issues. Um, or, but also that's, that's all we have to define ourselves right. is, is the ref the reflection of of what what we participate in? Mm -hmm. um, I'm going off on on a major tangent there. I'm, I'm like having I don't even know where I'm going with that. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna I'm gonna rein myself back in. You know, you you are um, you're in Bali now. You lived in Japan, and before you started Outpost, uh, you were doing a ton of research and you were writing a book on rare earth elements. Right. Uh, and basically we're advising governments on rare and exotic materials. And so where are most of those rare earth elements located? Sure. So, so I, um, a little bit of, of context. I used to run a, a nonprofit in Uganda that provided clean water uh, to rural societies in need. Um, and I've always been in somewhere the commodity space. Um, whether it was working in, in the government or, or um, in, in investments um, in emerging markets. Did you spend so, a lot of time in Uganda? So I, I spent, uh, I, I ran the organization there. I was back. I would go there for six weeks, eight weeks at a time. Um, but the, 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 the book that I wrote really uses these materials as a way to examine the future. And, and what I mean by that was... And the book was called The Elements of Power. The Elements of Power, correct. And what it, what it did was said, all right, well, we're at a time where the world's becoming wealthier, that um, development is happening in rural places in, in Uganda or, 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 or elsewhere, 
where they're starting Southeast to... Southeast Asia, Indonesia. Southeast Asia, where when I started my research, it was every, every half a person, the, 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 the cell phone penetration was under one per person. So on the average, uh, um, you know, there were three, uh, 220 million people in Indonesia and, and half of them have phones. Now, two times, there are two phones for every person. So the country now has 200 and uh, 400 million phones. So and this is in what in what time span? When did you start? Ten, to ten years. So what you're seeing is this increasing use of stuff, which is fabulous, um, that people have more access to to materials. I mean, more access to um, technology, so that they can have their, their their lives improve. But at the same time, there's tremendous resources. And while we look at the phone and it sits cuddly in in our hands, it has half the elements known to man in it to make it work. So when you're having 400 million of these and we're going through a, you know, we're going through one every year, we're going through a lot of resources and we're going through a lot of different types of resources that we haven't used in the past. So when I thought about, all right, well, Elon Musk's in, 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 um, you know, inventions are going to force us away from gas and we're going to rely on other materials to power the car. What are those materials? And so as we switch to a green society and, and move away from oil and gas, we have to mine a whole bunch of new materials. So what are these materials? What are the economic implications? What are the business implications and environmental implications of a green society? So that's really what I, what I, what I focus my time on. And it's, it's interesting for a number of reasons in relation to one, this podcast thinking through, I talk a lot about the software that's on these devices, but I don't often talk about the hardware in our devices or you know the way that Apple, as an example, builds an obsolescence into its devices so that we're throwing them out every year. What I don't know anything about the life cycle of the materials that go into these right. phones. I know there's companies that um, I know that there's companies that will recycle phones. You know, you can send them back and get thirty dollars or something like that. So I think it's interesting in that context. I also think it's really it's fascinating to me geographically where you are and the work that you've done, because I believe for this book, you did a lot of research in China, who are the, the number one kind of um, processors of these of these rare earth metals. Mm -hmm. And and now the news cycle, the current news cycle today about Hong Kong, about China, about the NBA, mm -hmm. um, a, a gamer today that uh, that won a, a huge gaming tournament, I think five hundred thousand dollars, spoke at the end of the, at the end of the tournament and and spoke in support of, of Hong Kong and the protests that are happening there. And Blizzard Games, a U.S. based company, took away his prize in support of the Chinese Communist Party. Wow! And so we're at a really fascinating juncture. So I'm just curious. We we have an economic system that's divorced from the political system. And and at what point do, do, do does does China um, say that we're gonna we're gonna wrap the economic system and and the political system together? Um, and I think with the with the tech world, you already see that happening. I mean, you go to China as a foreigner, and you don't you know the the, the most basic thing you used to be able to do was to buy something. You just gave cash and you bought something. And now when you go to a country where you, you don't even have the, the, the currency to buy something because everything's done online, you really feel like an outsider. So what you're, you're running into is, is um, this, and, and really that started the, the, the two um, tech ecosystems really because of political, not economic necessity. There was no reason why uh, Facebook could work everywhere in the world, but not China. And so you had this, these, this economic world um, that's really influenced by the political world. And how far does that go um, to separate, to, to kind of separate, separate the two? And going back to, to materials, why it's important um, for, for materials is because um, these mined materials or these supply lines are really um, stationary. You can't move a mine, you can't always move a, a processing facility. So when we think something like a, a tele, a, 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 an iPhone is something that's really simple, it's an American product that we buy, but it really comes from all over the world and from, from different minds and different processors. And when we start to split up these economic systems into two places, um, 
it really impacts the way that, that goods that we take for granted uh, get to us, whether that's gasoline, um, whether that's a smartphone, or whether that's a refrigerator. And um, China's example of, of limiting the way it recycles materials and not taking things from, from other countries really um, starts to underpin the way materials flow in this world. And that may not seem much to you now when you sit there and watch your um, YouTube video. Um, but over time, you'll see how prices change and things become more expensive because we're splitting up um, economic systems. And to that end, I was watching an interview that you gave in January 2017. And you said, instability will be the constant for the next four years. In regards to Trump and his election and, you know, the trade specifically, I believe it was about trade. So I'm curious, you know, here we are two and a half, two and three quarters of, of, a, of years later, um, almost through the first term, it feels like, though, I don't know. And we're in the middle of, of a trade war that's escalating. Mm -hmm. And I'm just curious, are you feeling the impact of that in Southeast Asia? Um, or, and if not, if, if so, how, if not, you know, what do you think are the, are the kind of the implications in the near term for, as someone that's, that's worked both in public policy, as well as in risk at an investment bank, I think right around the financial crisis or just after, um, and now as an entrepreneur in, in Southeast Asia and someone that wrote about these supply chains of China, I feel like I have this fantastic opportunity to just. And I'm still talking, but I just want to get your take on, on what's happening. Well, I feel, yes, instability is, is continuing. Um, so it's, it, it, it didn't start in 2017, but it, it sure as hell, um, you know, it picked up. And in, in, in Indonesia and Singapore, it's, it's a nervousness. Um, it's a nervousness born of, all right, 10 years of, of, of strong economic growth, um, instability in leaderships um, in the U.S., um, obviously, China has its difficulties as, as, as well, and it's, it's a fear for the future. Um, we haven't seen things fall apart um, anywhere in, in, in Southeast Asia like we have in, in, in the past, um, but people are beginning to hunker down and get ready for something. They just don't know exactly what that something, something will be. And it seems like uh, leadership both in the U.S. and China are doing all they can um, to continue to um, slow down opportunities for, for collaboration. And I think that we've got some trade talks coming up and they're going to be difficult because each side doesn't want to um, put itself into a, into a box. And um, in, doing, in doing so, it creates greater, greater instability because countries are, are, are pushing a narrative. And you've got leadership in both countries, in the U.S. and China, that are trying to play to their base. Um, as they go through uncertain economic times. So in, in short, instability will, will continue. Um, if I said three or four years, then, then I, was, I was mistaken. I, I think it'll be another, another two or three years upon that. Yeah, absolutely. I, I completely agree. I just don't see, I don't see an end in sight to the escalation. And when I think about Southeast Asia, if I had to kind of color it, I know you know, obviously Indonesia is a massive country, 220 to 270 million people, depending on who you ask. Um, I view and Singapore, huge trade hub what, with Western and Eastern ties. I view these, these countries and others around almost, almost in a checkered flag of like China and the U.S. flags together, right? Because they're such important hubs and, and they're just coming into their own identities, uh, as emerging economies with massive internal opportunity for economic growth. And yet, you know, they're beholden to this, to this trade war. And so, you know, I just, the flow of people, the flow of tourism to these places, a place like Bali is truly where East and West come together and merge and create this beautiful synergy. And it's such a shame to think about the continued isolationism that's happening mm -hmm. between two beautiful cultures. I, I was, 2008, I was um, tailing a marketing director at Jones & Vining, which is a shoe last manufacturing company that had facilities in Zhongshan and Dongguan in China, just below Shenzhen. And I was next to the Foxconn factory. 
mm-hmm. before any of the news about Foxconn even came out, you know, with, with, with the lifestyle and, and the suicides that were happening there. But Foxconn manufactures a huge percentage of chips and for computer parts in both Japan and and the U.S. And so what does a company like Foxconn, which I believe is a Taiwanese company, but with many facilities in China, what do they do? I guess one, I wonder if you if you have thoughts on that. And then two, would the U.S., assuming we continue these isolationist policies, would the U.S. be able to pick up the slack in manufacturing of rare, rare um, earth materials, I think that's the right term, to, um, to have enough product for, for the demand for our technology without China? Sure. Well, I think, I think we're, we're getting to a point where um, the notion that a country can be self-sufficient in, in its resources is, is quaint. It, it really cannot be. Um, because we're not just um, eating grapes or, or pumping gas that go directly into a car. The supply lines that take to make everything travel globally. And if we think that um, uh, differences in you know, trade wars won't, won't affect us because we can, we can produce uh, neodymium in the U.S. that might go into a magnet that's still produced in China, you know, we're, we're, we're misguided. Um, the, there's no way around uh, globalism at this point for for materials. The only way around it is to um, decide that we are going to pay tremendous amounts more, uh, and and that seems unrealistic. And countries like China have the same realization. Um, although China can be a little bit more self sufficient uh, than the U.S. because of some good geologic uh, from for some geologic good fortune in certain materials, it's still reliant on other countries for for iron or oil and gas. Um, so they too need to keep the, the the shipping lanes, if you will, open. So the literal shipping lanes in yeah. the South China Sea. Exactly, exactly. So um, there is bluster and there is patriotism, and um, sure that um, is, uh, is 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 the way that that countries will continue to look forward. Um, but there's this realization that hey, we need to be. Um, on the same page so that our economies can, can continue to, to grow. Um, the question is, is at some point, does the patriotism start to outshine, outshine what realistic policy should and can be? Um, it, it looks quite possible at, at, this, at this point. Um, but then the impacts um, will start to be more profound as, as material flows are, 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 are cut off. Or, um, you know, it's a, they have a major challenge in the recycling world right now. Um, that materials that you're separating from um, your your food from your from your plastics um, are are happening at home, but they're not being recycled because there aren't recycling facilities that are um, enabled outside China to really take the mass of materials that that we've that we've built up. So we end up throwing things more. We throw throw more things away. So. You know there there are implications to to policy decisions, and um, you know we'll see over time how how the the administration in the u s and, and and China can get along to to continue um, growth as we know it, or it changes up and and things become more expensive, and your iPhone is fifty percent more or things of that nature. yeah, it's really we live in fascinating and and uh chaotic times potentially with with a whole lot of entropy a lot of movement happening right now on so many different levels and that's why i was so excited to speak with you because i feel like where you sit you know with you really have have a unique perspective on these on these opportunities so you mentioned that outpost is you know it started as a side gig Mm -hmm. Is this now where you're focusing 100% of your time, or are you still working on some public policy ef- efforts? I know uh, you worked on building a UN support facility for Indonesian recovery back in the day. Obviously, water and clean water in Uganda, and I believe even in J- clean water in Japan. Right. So now, is is Outpost with singing for you, or are you doing other work as well? Sure. Well, I, I um, had an opportunity to, to testify in front of Congress over these material flows, and that was in late 2017, early 2018. What was that like, testifying in front of Congress? 
Uh, it was, it, as someone who's worked in the administration, it was a fascinating perspective on uh, the legislative body and, and the process and the questions that they were asking. And I was testifying on a, on a bill that was um, somewhat political, um, but was doomed never to pass. Um, so it was a fascinating experience on the seeing the, the performative process of, of government, if you will. So, uh, but that was, the, that was the last time that I, 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 I really focused on, on these materials um, wholeheartedly. Um, but, you know, the, the story doesn't change. Um, you know, it's, it's uh, that we're still using more and more materials and they become a little bit harder to, to find because the easier materials have already been found. Um, so things become more expensive to get out of the ground. Um, and then their implications, the environmental implications are, are still the same. So um, I think it's a story and a perspective that I, that I have, uh, but, but it's a trend um, that I'm not looking at right now. What, what excites me um, is to look how the, the trend of, of people is changing and how um, they're not tied to a specific location and how offices themselves are becoming antiquated and, and the physical office and offices of the future are becoming more networks. And as virtual reality becomes more of a thing than actually physically meeting in person um, is a little bit less necessary and allowing people greater flexibility and where they're going to spend their time. And being able to create um, a supportive infrastructure for those people, whether that be services um, like living spaces in, in Cambodia and Bali, or other services that support that breakdown of traditional offices, that's where I like to spend my time at the moment. And that's, that opens up an entire can of worms uh, and brings us, back to, brings us back to where we started. And I agree that that's, that's an interesting area of exploration. Uh, people seem to still be flowing, flowing freely, although trade is, is not as free as it once was. And it'll be, it'll be, uh, it'll be something to watch over the next few years as, as what happens with, with the flow of people uh, between, between countries. And so, you know, we've been at this for about an hour and 10. I want to give you back some of your time. I think just based on what you said just a minute ago, I could probably continue and go a lot deeper, but this has been a lot. We've covered a lot of ground. Uh, and I just want to say thank you again for, for coming on, David. Uh, it's been great to You're chat welcome. with you. I've experienced what, what you're building with Outpost and the community that you've put together and it's special. And so I'm excited to see, see where it goes. Right. Well, thank you very much, Mark. I really appreciate your, uh, your taking time to, to interview me today. Awesome. All right. Cool. Thank you much. No problem. Thank you for listening. I hope that you enjoyed that episode and I hope that you're enjoying the podcast. It's been a really fun ride so far. I just get so excited every time I meet some of these incredible people and just love sharing their stories and, and ideas with you all. You can learn more about the show at thelookuppodcast.com. That's T-H-E, lookuppodcast.com. Uh, you can follow me on social media at Wark Meinstein, W-A-R-C-M-E-I-N-S-T-E-I-N on both Twitter, Instagram, um, and Medium, and Facebook. Uh, we have a Facebook page for the show as well, The Look Up Podcast um, on Facebook, so check us out. You can also subscribe to our mailing list on the website for more future updates. If there's anything from the show that you want to catch, I've posted that in the show links for you to check out. And if there's any way that I can improve, please let me know. Feel free to reach out. If you have any guest recommendations, please let me know. Other than a couple of individuals who are helping me out in the background, you know, this is a passion project and I'm always open to feedback and any kind of support. I want to thank Sam Palumbo and Patch Kid Music for the sound editing and the intro and outro song that he created. And I want to thank Hello There Collective for their support on my social media. You can check them out at hellotherecollective.com. All right, that's enough for me. I'm sure you're ready to go on to your next activity. Thank you for listening. And please come back again next week for another episode of the Look Up podcast. Yeah.